Good afternoon. My name is Professor Michael Kerr from the Department of War Studies at King's College London. And it is a great privilege and a pleasure to offer you a very warm welcome uh, to the launch of Dr. Stacey Gutkowski's excellent new book, Religion, War and Israel's Secular Millennials, Being Reasonable? Question mark. This has just been launched by Manchester University Press and it questions how Jewish Israeli millennials who came of age in the shadow of the Oslo peace process, the questions how they feel uh, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict today uh, by focusing on their lived experiences and the collective memory of this generation. Dr. Gutzkowski is a co-director of the Centre for the Study of Divided Societies and senior lecturer in conflict studies in the Department of War Studies at King's College London, where we have been fortunate enough to have her as a colleague since 2011. Stacey is also the co-director of the Non-Religion and Secularity Research Network, and she is co-editor of uh, the book series Religion and its Others, Studies in Religion, Non-Religion and Secularity. And she also sits on the Academic Advisory Board of the Cambridge Centre for Palestinian Studies. Prior to joining King's, Stacey was an ESRC postdoctoral researcher in the Department of International Relations at uh, the University of Sussex and a visiting scholar at the Centre for the Study of Religion and Conflict in Arizona State University and a research associate with the Religion and Ethics in the Making of War and Peace program at the University of Edinburgh. Stacey's research uh, interrogates broadly the various relationships between war, peace, religion and the secular, sitting at the crossroads of Middle Eastern studies, political sociology, religious studies and critical security studies. Her current research uh, focuses on theorizing intersections between emotion, violence and the secular, post-war spirituality and self-making in the Middle East, analyzing moderation as a political category, interreligious pluralism among Syrian refugees and their hosts in Jordan and Lebanon, and interreligious pluralism and youth faith peace building in the Middle East and Northern Ireland. She holds a PhD in International Studies from the University of Cambridge, an MPhil in International Peace Studies from Trinity College Dublin, and a BA in Philosophy from Wellesley College. Stacey is the author of several books and numerous articles and book chapters on politics, security, religion, and secularism in Jordan, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Iraq, Egypt, Afghanistan, the United States, and the United Kingdom. A native of Arizona, she recently added to a long list of achievements this year by becoming a British citizen. And it is my pleasure uh, um, also to welcome our special guest who's going to be discussing uh, Stacey's new book. Um, and he is Ian Black. And currently he is visiting senior fellow at the Middle East Centre at LSE. I need very little introduction uh, um, for those of you who are Middle East watchers, as he appears regularly on international television and radio channels commenting on current affairs. Ian was formerly Middle East editor, European editor, diplomatic editor, and Jerusalem correspondent for the Guardian newspaper. And he has also written for the Washington Post, the New York Times, and The Economist. He is author of several books, the latest of which is Enemies and Neighbors, Arabs and Jews in Palestine and Israel in 1917 to 2017. Uh, this book launch is being recorded and uh, we will live stream, we will stream it uh, immediately afterwards onto YouTube. Uh, and Stacey has also compiled a War Studies podcast on the book and uh, we'll put a link to that uh, in the chat so you can access that in your own time. Uh, after Ian and Stacey have discussed the book in the, in the last 20 minutes of the event, we will have a, a Q&A where you can put your questions to Dr. Gutkowski. And uh, I'd ask you to please put those into the, the chat box 
uh, and uh, Ian will pick these up and uh, put them to uh, Stacey then. Okay, without further ado, I'll hand over to Ian. Thank you, Ian. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm unmuting. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Good. Okay, um, I think that Michael was wrong to say that the questions should be posed in the Q&A box, in the chat box. Uh, could you put them in the Q&A box, I think? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be uh, asked to, uh, to uh, interview or, or have a dialogue, if you like, with uh, Stacey's um, with Stacy about her impressively researched new book. Um, um, for me, the, the overwhelming, the overriding impression, if you like, was a, a generational difference. So I was the correspondent uh, in Jerusalem between, uh, it seems like, you know, a long time ago, between 1984 and 1993. And I left with impeccable timing just before the Oslo Agreement of uh, September 1993. So my experience is of a very different generation. And that's what I'd like to focus on because of course, the, the title of your book is Religion, War and Israel's Secular Millennials. And uh, the millennials, uh, the generation, of millennials uh, begins in 1980-1981. Uh, so my experience is completely different. So I want to ask you about that and the changes that have taken place. I very much like the concept of uh, generational memory. I think it's from Karl Mann Mannheim. So what, uh, what was your impression based on statistics you know, uh, 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 impressively empirical uh, evidence of the, the generational memory of the millennials or secular millennials. Over to you. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak to you as well. So this is, uh, this is really great. Um, I might just talk a little bit about the kind of the background to the book background to the social group, give a little bit of context about their um, generational memory, as, as you say, and then um, I think talk about what I think is the key finding um, about their, their generational memory. So for about 15 years, um, I've been interested in how people who describe themselves as secular or not especially religious uh, understand war and violence. Um, and for 12 years, I co-ran a research network um, which investigated what this meant in different contexts for people who in their given context say, hmm, I'm not really all that into religion. In the academic world, there's a lot of really great research about religion and how religious and ethnic symbols um, help fuel and can also be used to end national conflicts. Um, but there's hardly anything at all about this other realm of human experience where people have quite mixed feelings um, about the majority religious tradition in their society. Now, Israel is an interesting case study um, for studying these things, um, not least because it's experienced repeated wars, um, but also because Judaism is so central to social life, politics, and state law. Um, there are about 40% of the society who claim to be uh, largely non-observant, Hiloni. Um, this term, Hiloni, translates um, imperfectly into English as, as secular Jew. Um, but importantly, I don't think of this uh, exclusively as a religious group, but a religio class. Um, they're largely middle class, two thirds Ashkenazi of European descent, one third. Um, Mizrahi, descended from Middle Eastern Jews, but they're important for the reasons that you talked about, about, you know, the time that, that you were there previously. These are uh, the former and to some extent still the current elites 
within um, the state. They are culturally, sometimes literally, descended um, from the generations of European settlers who, who founded the state and who ran it for 30 years, um, who, who ran the army, and who also, um, importantly, started the peace movement in the 1980s and, um, and 1990s. So one thing that um, Charles Liebman and others have pointed out is that Judaism is fundamentally intertwined in people's everyday lives um, in society in Israel, even among Jews who say, oh, I, I only celebrate the holidays. Israel is a state where Judaism is privileged as part of law um, reinforced by the 2018 changes to, uh, to its basic law, to its constitutional structure. But I argue in the book that we can still study what Talal Assad calls the power of the secular in Israel, uh, but we need to recognize that it has this, um, as Raison calls it, this Jewish valence uh, to it. Um, as you say, since the 1980s, Israel has changed a lot, and not just because it's um, there's been this shift in this political elite, a diversification. Um, from the secular Ashkenazi uh, group who ran the state for its first 30 years. Israel has become a, a capitalist, neoliberal economy with high levels of consumerism and individualism. It's been impacted um, by globalization, by inward immigration, um, which has brought uh, new ideas, including um, new spiritual, non-Jewish spiritual ideas, which I, I talk about in the book. Um, but at the same time, Jewish beliefs and practices have become more prominent in public life uh, and politics, what some people call religionization or, or hadatha in, uh, in Hebrew. Of course, Israel has also experienced a failed peace process, repeated wars with the Palestinians, as well as um, the strengthening of the security, political, and economic apparatus of occupation. As a result, the population has shifted to the right politically and the peace movement has grown very small since the period when you were there in. All these trajectories have intensified for this generation in the 2000s and 2010s. They predate them, but they intensify, have intensified um, during this period when millennials became adults, when they um, sort of came to their political awakening after Oslo in the 2000s and 2010s. Now, Almag and Almag um, published uh, a large study of this generational group um, with about a thousand people, both the social group um, and their, uh, their teachers, their employers, their parents. It attracted a lot of attention um, in Israel. I did my field work uh, in the two years after the 2014 Gaza war. Um, I built on their work. Um, but I looked more closely at the dynamics of religious nationalism, which I think, you know, were important, are important, um, but somewhat still understudied. Um, so there's a perception in this period that I'm talking about post Oslo that Israel is Jewish Israeli society is growing more religious and more right wing. But what is that? What does that really mean? How do we unpack that? So I asked two questions in the book, one to do with the case study and then one comparative. Um, I asked, as a young secular Jew, what has it felt like to come of age during a phase of national conflict when some Palestinian and Israeli government leaders, not just fringe figures, have used ethno-religious symbols to motivate and divide? And then I asked the comparative question, what do violent political conflicts look and feel like to people who claim to somewhat distance themselves from the majority religious tradition in their given context, but are fundamentally embedded within it? Now, there are a lot of interesting books you could write um, about this social group. I focused on four case studies, which I think allow me to interrogate that long-term interest in the relationship between, um, between violence, religion, and the, and the secular. So I, in the book, look in detail and attitudes towards um, uh, jihad and Islam, towards what the IDF calls Jewish consciousness education, um, towards attitude, I looked at attitudes towards the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount, and also what it feels like um, to live through a violent attack 
and I tried to tell stories that were would be of interest both to people who are interested in a comparative study of religion and violence, but also Jewish Israelis who um, know a great who are the you know know a great deal about about their society. Um, but there is a lot still, of course, to write about this group and to write about how Jewishness and Zionism are are evolving among millennials. Um, so that's the context. But what was what was the main uh, main finding? Um, what I found, and this is touches on what you've said about generational memory, is a new way of understanding why Haloni millennials across the political spectrum, from right to left, and including all their subgroups, think continuing on occupation indefinitely is regrettable but reasonable. Now. When you study aspects of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as I did, you can't help but bump up against something which is widely recognized in Israel, that the country is moving politically to the right uh, on the question of maintaining occupation, as well as becoming, quote unquote, more religious. But regular people and researchers usually understand stronger attachment to Jewish identity and practice in Israel as associated with right wing politics. So they assume that if religiosity increases naturally right wing conservatism will increase and in support for occupation and the settlements. I'm not disputing that this happens, um, but I'm arguing that the explanation is too simplistic um, and it misses a key point. Not everyone is becoming more religious. Not everyone is swept along with a rising tide of Hadatha religionization. But left wing progressive politics on occupation has grown increasingly niche. So we need a better explanation for this. And I try to do that in the book. So my research, as I said, was um, from, with Haloni millennials across the spectrum from right to left. Um, this was the group who were the backbone of the peace process in the in the 80s and the 90s, um, but today are fairly evenly split, a third, a third, a third um, across the political spectrum. And what I found was that these discourses and these sort of feelings and sentiments were shared even among the left wing, that the people who describe themselves as left wing, that continuing the occupation for now is reasonable, if regrettable. Now that they would feel this way isn't surprising. Um, and the popular explanation emphasizes a combination of conflict fatigue, um, people feeling unhappy about the direction of, of the economy and domestic politics and political corruption, um, and also the impact of immigration from the former Soviet Union, which swelled the ranks of, of the Hilonim within, within Israel. Now, this is the generation who fought for, um, if we count 2019, five wars against Hamas and Islamic Jihad, uh, and one against Hezbollah. And they also grew up um, on the other side of Israel's various separation barriers, separation walls, separated psychologically and also physically from Palestinians. Um, at the same time that mainstream politicians have been emphasizing the exclusively Jewish character of the state. They've absorbed um, politicians' messages that while there's no Palestinian partner for peace, it's best to concentrate on the economy, and their own lives, and their own futures. Popular explanations also emphasize that Hilonim from the former Soviet Union have swelled the, the right wing among Hilonim, um, making this group a larger one than those from um, this, this veteran um, background and that those veteran descendants have stuck to the left, but that's an overgeneralization. I found something to add to this um, explanation that we have. Because the explanation leaves out agency. People aren't just puppets who are part of larger social trends and they do what the, they see reflected in the media and they do what the politicians um, tell them. So we need to look more carefully and look beyond um, public opinion polls 
And so in my research, I'm taking a, um, a feminist approach, looking um, you know, deeply at how people talk about themselves and, and their lived experience, because as feminists have told us, the personal is political. Um, these things matter. So to understand what's going on in the book, I argue that we need to think more deeply about two things. First, how secular Judaism is evolving in Israel, and also the extent to which secular Jewish Israeli millennials are influenced by a globalized youth culture. In particular, I think we need to start thinking more creatively and more expansively about what secular Jewishness in Israel is. That it's not just, for example, keeping kashrut or, or an ethnic identity with religious symbols mobilized by the early secular Zionist settlers. So what I observed um, is what I call a neo-romantic sensibility among Hellenium I interviewed. Um, I'm developing something that Talal Asad a uh, point he makes in his book, Formations um, of the Secular. I say this is a similar, um, I, there aren't clear, you know, there aren't direct historical connections between the 19th century romantics and um, my group, but there are a couple of things they, they share um, in, in common. Uh, most importantly, this emphasis on personal intuition and emotional experience, um, greater self-expression, but also greater attachment um, to, uh, to one's nation. Jewish thinkers were influenced by Romanticism as well. Um, in Europe, they were excited about how creative individuals could interpret Jewish tradition and develop new ways of being meaningfully Jewish for themselves beyond rabbinical authority. Like the Romantics, and also millennials around the world, my interviewees had a commitment to self-expression. They emphasized sincerity and critically personal experience. We talked about philosophical exploration within and beyond um, Judaism. Helani culture has also evolved beyond um, the, maybe the secular Ashkenazi um, model that, um, that influenced earlier generations. Um, but the important thing is like, like the romantics, like other millennials around the world, this group emphasized relying heavily on their personal experiences um, as providing a personal moral compass to help them make decisions. Personal experience included what happened to them, also what they went out and, and researched um, themselves. Um, and they are looking at facts, at evidence, but they read the evidence in a particular way. I, I call them in the book fulcrum citizens. Um, I saw a deep commitment to the state and drawing on their personal compass, they see themselves as the most moderate among moderates, trying to balance out um, the extremes within their own society and among Palestinians. And this is something I, I saw across the political spectrum. But it's important to remember that they came of age under deepening conditions of separation from Palestinians since Oslo. So their personal experience is largely focused within Jewish Israeli society and this shapes their views. So, for example, um, for leftists who want to do something to improve society during the 1990s, this might have been advocating against occupation. Um, but now socioeconomic activism um, is largely focused uh, within Green Line Israel, within Green Line Israel, and I call this a kind of Green Line liberalism. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Sorry, um, why not? So in your conclusion, mm. you talk about um, connecting the personal and the political. So I have various questions that flow from that mm. uh, overarching concept. So for example, I was interested, 
I'd be interested to hear your view about, um, obviously based on your um, interviews, about attitudes to settlers. Settlers now form 600 and something thousand. Um, they're the primary reason for the increasing uh, unviability, if you like, of a two-state solution. There are other factors as well. But of course, you know, for the last 20 odd years, the number of settlers uh, has expanded. Uh, what did you perceive as the attitudes of the generation of millennials that form the heart of your work to the settlement enterprise? Uh, do they make distinction, for example, between, you know, extremists and uh, the hilltop youth, for example? Um, is, the, it, it, is there a relevance of the contribution of the settler community uh, to the death of the uh, two-state solution, which their parents' generation um, often believed in as the only solution to, you know, wh what everybody will agree is one of the world's most divisive and toxic conflicts. So there are a couple of questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, let me start with a, with a couple of couple of those things. Um, the generationally pivotal experience I thought um, was being involved in the disengagement from settlements in, in Gaza and uh, also some in the West Bank. Um, you know, I, I use Carl Mannheim's generational memory and, you know, I, Mannheim observed and other people have, I guess, um, provided the empirical data to back this up is that multiple generations can live through a pivotal experience, something like, for example, 9-11, but those, in it, those pivotal experiences that happen when people are in their early 20s really shape how, how they see the world. And, and this experience really shaped how they, they saw the settlement project, either because they themselves had, were taking people out of their homes or, or involved um, in that, uh, or they had um, a family or, or close friends who were, who were involved in that. Um, and I found a real, um, It had an impact in their um, concern for the cohesiveness of Jewish Israeli society. Um, it had been a, a generational trauma. The idea that the ideas that had been circulating at the time that potentially this could lead to civil civil unrest among uh, among Jewish Israelis. Um, for those who had been involved in the, dis the disengagement, um, as they saw it carrying out their, their uh, jobs, um, as sent by the IDF, uh, the experience of um, being called names to their face, being told they were like the Nazis to their face in close proximity um, had, had, a, had had a seismic impact. So we, I mean, we know what's been happening in Israel after afterwards that there's been a reinvigoration uh, among the religious Zionist circles within um, within society, and uh, so my group have have lived through that. They see that group as um, as a rising group within uh, within society. They don't see them um, as the other. The other are, as you say, the hilltop youth who are also millennials. Uh, they see them as the extremists. They see um, their own role as uh, as balancing that out. Um, they widely condemned um, violence against Palestinians and Palestinian property in the in the West Bank. Um, 
And for, you know, they used the language, those who believed in a two-state solution still used the language of the two-state solution, but said, we're stuck. There's nothing that we can, we can do about this now. And they felt um, quite powerless to change things. These are my observations. This is, of course, a group that can speak very well for themselves within um, within the public space. I'm just, you know, providing the, I suppose, the academic uh, perspective on that. But did you see? Did you encounter anybody who believed in the um, the idea of one state with equal rights for Jews and Arabs between, to use the increasingly fashionable phrase between the river and the sea. Did you encounter any, a, anybody who uh, uh, spoke of, uh, of that goal with any kind of hope? Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated society, right? So if you're going to, you know, do this properly, rigorously, academically, you're, you try to get everybody. So yes, I certainly spoke to um, spoke to a few people, um, you know, who, who held these views, who spoke about um, a one state solution, potentially, who spoke about a potential for a confederation, who could imagine um, something like a consociational democracy um, in these lands, um, who spoke about um, what, a, what a democratic State would look like that wasn't just a, a Jewish democratic state. So it's it's not all it's not all doom and gloom. But we know from public opinion polls and from this research that um, there's also plenty to be pessimistic about as well. But to, did, did you encounter, for example, people, millennials, who uh, were interested in promoting Jewish Arab cooperation? within the green line, at least. Yeah, I the mean, green line is the pre-1967 borders, for those who don't know. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, had, I spoke to people who were um, involved in that. Um, I also spoke to others who were involved um, in promoting uh, projects also with Palestinian activists um, in Ramallah, in the in the West Bank, um, again a generational issue, and you know there's definitely more research to be done on um, Palestinian millennials and and the interaction between the two. Um, but they talked about you know the difficulties of um, of the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which had um, in in their view um, narrowed opportunities for cooperation that Palestinians didn't want to cooperate. Um, with them, um, I found, you know, of course, you can find a few people who uh, support, you know, support the BDS, um, uh, we're even within within Israel. So um, that's what I found among activists. I've observed um, in recent times, of course, Israel may be facing uh, the fourth election in less than uh, two years. Um, in recent elections, I've noticed that um, quite a lot of Israeli Jews vote for the uh, joint list, which is the combined list of basically uh, Arab uh, parties. Uh, did you encounter that at all? On the argument that the, the left has failed, uh, you know, the Labour Party has has now less seats than ever before. Uh, merits has shrunk. Um, so the Jewish Israelis uh, have crossed the line in breaching the taboo, if you like, uh, the previously held taboo uh, of uh, voting for Arab uh, parties. Have you come across that at all? My research was um, primarily either side of the uh, the 2015 election. Sure. Sure. Um, I saw, you know, there was a lot of discuss discussion about the the demise of labor, mm -hmm. um, the demise of merits. 
um, interesting to see Meretz constructed as, um, as an extremist group by at least one of my, my interviewees, you know, they said, this is the hard left. This is beyond the bounds of, you know, the reasonable middle, the reasonable mm -hmm. middle. Um, in terms of uh, voting for the joint list, uh, I, I mean, among those I, I happen to speak to within this research, that was um, largely a bridge too far for them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I mean, we, we have seen within um, the past uh, three elections, which took place after, after this research, that um, the, the left has seen that as um, something credible to, to vote for the joint list. And maybe that is, um, you know, the, the new direction, you know, as we're, we're staring down the barrel of this fourth election, as you said, you know, looking to, you know, who, who can build a coalition. Um, that, that, I mean, one thing I would say generally um, speaking, and again, you know, I didn't speak to everybody uh, in the entire country, but um, there was more understanding about um, the Palestinian Authority and, and that dimension of Palestinian politics than there was um, about Palestinian politics within the state of Israel. But again, you know, this um, I, I didn't speak to, to everyone, but this was, you know, when people talk about the state, they're talking about the, um, the majority. So you completed your research in around 2016, right? Mm -hmm. I guess. So yeah. we've had four years since then of the most uh, openly biased American president since uh, 1948. Uh, whose name escapes me. Um, um, I, I, I don't want to mention him by name, of course. Um, but uh, things presumably will have accelerated uh, since then. The direction of travel that you observed in your research up to 2016 uh, presumably has only got worse, no? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, of course, I've been watching the um, the past four, four years very, um, very carefully. And I, I don't think the direction of travel has changed in any seismic way. I mean, in terms of um, Israeli politics, you know, seeing um, the swelling of, of the center, um, blue and white and Gantz as, a, as an alternative to the Netanyahu government, that seemed to me um, an outgrowth of the things I, I found about what was happening in the, politi in the political center um, among, this, among this group. Um, and then in terms of the, um, uh, the, new American, uh, the new American plan and the subsequent, uh, you know, the Abraham Accords that, that we have seen signed between, um, uh, between Israel and, um, and Arab states in the region. I mean, I, I I saw this as a, again, as, a, as an outgrowth um, that the Palestinian side of things is, um, you know, the two state solution is dead or at least paused. Um, but if we can make peace with the Arab world, then this would be acceptable. And this is something that I, you know, um, they did, many interviewees did raise was the possibility of, um, of making, uh, making agreements with, with other Arab states, um, mm -hmm. alliances, bearing in mind the, the Iranian uh, threat to, uh, to all actors involved. And they thought that this was perhaps the way forward because this, this is peace. But of course, you know, uh, I'm not the first person to make this observation, but it's clearly uh, attractive for Israeli Jews to be able to fly to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and even uh, Khartoum in Sudan, but if you can't go to Ramallah or Nablus or uh, Bethlehem safely, uh, it's surely uh, not a solution to the world's most uh, divisive conflict, is it? <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think we, I think we agree on that point. And I, I have to say, I, you know, having been um, observing these things on, on media and social media, as you say, I mean, I can see 
a phenomenon, you know, I talk about it in one of the chapters about, you know, um, this is so, you know, uh, sort of jetting off to Dubai is also, um, you know, it's a form of self, you know, self exploration and, mm. and tourism. And, you know, it very much fits with this kind of Heloni neo romanticism um, that mm. I that I talk mm. about here. But um, mm. you know, certainly that's not a that's not a solution to the, uh, the long term problem. So we're coming to the end of our dialogue in order to uh, allow people to ask questions. So what, what, do you, what do you see uh, are the main implications of your research for the future? So, I mean, I, I think in terms of the, uh, the political future, I think I've um, found a, a deep reason why there will be paralysis politically on, on the occupation and on, on um, uh, Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict and long-term peace. Because if you see these things, not just as a matter of who you vote for, but who you, who you are deeply as a reasonable person, then those things we know from political psychology and, and personal psychology are very, very difficult to, to change. Um, so, I mean, I think I've just found uh, for the future, another dimension of, of what we know about, about paralysis. Um, and, you know, something that one of my interviews talked about that I've quoted in the conclusion is, you know, about the need for a real seismic change, um, that that is the only thing that is going to bring about something, um, uh, a shift in Palestinian-Israeli uh, relations. Um, so I think those are the, the future uh, uh, implications. I, you know, I talk in the future, I talk in the book about what else, you know, we could study about this group or, you know, what the implications are for the study, future study of, of religion and violence. But, you know, I think the, the big, um, most important story is about the, um, the continuing political paralysis around the possibility of a, of a two-state solution and a Palestinian state. But do you see any possibility of, of, of change in, the, in that current paralysis with, in terms of its effect on the millennial generation that are the focus of your research? Um, well, one of the things that I, I focus on a great deal, um, and it comes out in in various places in the book, and it comes out in, in chapter five, I think, is about um, empathy and about feelings of feelings of empathy um, for Palestinians, even among those who were on the right. Um, so even if they were simply just imagining what these other people would be like, rather than necessarily meeting them, they still when, when um, asked, maybe, you know, pressed, expressed, you know, expressed empathy for a shared common humanity. So maybe then we should be slightly optimistic um, if the political stars align. But the, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm maybe being annoying here, but no. surely, surely, surely you understand don't you? I, I, I would have thought you, you, you do understand that the level of human contact between millennial Israelis and millennial Palestinians, particularly those who live in the occupied territories, is very limited. No? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I make a distinction, of course, between Palestinians who are also Israeli citizens, but that's mm. a different story. Mm. But surely, Surely it's a factor of the other dehumanization, lack of empathy, no? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I'm trying to, you know, pull out the, you know, the little bits of, of positivity to this, but as long as separation continues, it's hard, it's hard to see. Um, you know, I, I think one of the most poignant things was when asking people to imagine who the other, you know, imagine them other to put themselves in in their shoes and having little basis to imagine besides what's in what's in the news um, or indeed you know um, outright failures of the contact hypothesis where Israelis and Palestinians had had met 
abroad and it hadn't been all you know a wonderful experience where suddenly they they understood each other so you know uh, i think i as i see it separation is the is the real key here. so um i'm going to ask a few questions that uh, have appeared in the uh, in the chat box so how much of the current population jewish israelis presumably are Sephardic, Sephardim. Ah, right. So this is about uh, thirty percent. Uh, oh, so I presume they mean Sephardim Mizrahi, non Ashkenazi. That fifty percent. Okay. Half half. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, another question is: Could you expand a little on the commodification of Arab culture, and the Israeli millennial interest in consuming Arab? culture, I would add food actually also, yeah. without engaging with the Palestinians themselves. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I didn't research this, you know, in great detail. So I, I can't uh, tell you more than probably you, you already know about that. This is a, um, uh, there's been, I think, under this generation, even greater commodification um, of, uh, of Palestinian culture, um, of food, of, a, of appropriation of these things, and probably separation is also um, also a part of it that the, this generation cannot just, you know, doesn't go to, um, to East Jerusalem or visit the West Bank um, largely for, um, I think, maybe uh, tourism and leisure rather than um, uh, much inter you know deep interaction um and that this is um this is the result um you know there's lots of really fascinating things that are written um for example on um on yafo and on um sort of uh the appropriation of of arab life in in yafo and um the i think the implications for um for secular millennials, I mean, they're deeply implied in in this of you know uh, not only buying up buying up properties but um, sort of appropriating the culture um, as well. So another question is: Do you think that the way the media portrays the ongoing conflict adds to the fire and increases the passions of both parties, leading to the exacerbation? of those confrontations so the role the role of the media um i mean i think we have we can talk about different uh different forms of media here right so um the media was something that my interviewees liked to talk about a lot because this is after the 2014 um, war so they were spending a lot of time uh, looking at not only how the Israeli um, media was was portraying uh, Israel's actions in the 2014 war, but also also the the global um, media, and there was um, substantial anger at the portrayal um, in um, the European media, certainly um, that they had not taken an, an even-handed. Uh, approach to the, the portrayal of the, the 2014 war. Um, so we have to ask, our, ask ourselves, you know, um, what, what kind of media are there possibly neutral media sources? Um, one thing my interviews, a couple of them talked about was, you know, going kind of media hopping and trying to find all these different um, perspectives on, on Israel to try to, to try to understand their own society um, beyond, uh, beyond the media. But, you know, certainly the, the media in, in Israel um, portrays its own side as, as the Palestinian media portrays, uh, portrays its own side as well. Um, the real inflammatory thing, rather than the traditional media, really was was social media, Facebook, um, the role of, of Facebook in Hebrew. Uh, that was something when I wanted to talk about 
um, after the disengagement. So now a lot of these intra-Jewish Israeli arguments among millennials are happening um, you know, on Facebook and they happened on Reddit. Um, and so there's this, for millennials, this whole other world, which is just as real, which is the virtual world on social media. And that's where um, the really inflammatory stuff happens, um, not just between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians, but within um, young Jewish Israeli society. Um, and this, I don't think we can, you know, we can blame the media for framing a discourse. We can blame politicians for framing a dis for framing a discourse. But actually, what's making it inflammatory is the way people are interacting in this virtual space. Um, I would like to ask a question of my own again. Um, do you? Um, I, I, obviously, I read your book um, and was very impressed by the efforts that you went to capture uh, genuine voices. Maybe I've forgotten, but did anybody address the concept increasingly popular of explaining the Zionist enterprise and Palestine and Israel as an example of settler colonialism? Do you find that helpful as a concept? I mean, I find the frame helpful in understanding Israel as a, as a settler society that mm -hmm. we can think of in conjunction with other settler societies like my own in the United States. But this is not something um, that was discussed among my group at all. Um, I had some conversations early on about uh, about post-Zionism. Um, hmm. I needed to explain what post-Zionism was, which you know kind of goes to show how what a you know elite intellectual project maybe it's become not something that you know resonated um, with young people. I mean, there were definitely frustrated leftists who said, you know, we need, uh, we need a new way forward. Now, you know, many of, of them were also um, working within a, in a hegemonic um, Zionist frame. But um, in terms of talking about the country as a, as a settler society, I mean, that was, I don't think I saw that in a, you know, a very minority view again, like amongst, uh, you know, activists who are talking about the possibility of a of a secular state mm -hmm. and of a truly democratic um, politically plural state where palestinians are equally represented so the next question is uh, from a participant and indeed it's highly relevant to what we've just been talking about uh, could a one-state solution that is inclusive of all to all parties, uh, is it possible considering the deep fragmentation of the two sides? Mm. Well, I mean, this is this is the million-dollar question, isn't it? Um, you know, and we can. I mean, there are more people who are far better placed to talk about the one-state solution than me. What I can say is that among this group, there was still. The discussion was still framed in terms of a two-state solution, if they were on the left or if they were in, in the center. So I, I suppose that's why it feels, uh, why it came across that they were stuck. In terms of, um, in terms of a one-state solution, again, this was articulated by people on the, you know, um, very, very far left and not in any great detail. Um, I would say that overall, there was a stronger, stronger feeling um, that the Palestinians should, should have their state, that they should have a state constructed in, in their own image, um, rather than um, a, a one state democracy. Um, whether it's, you know, whether it's possible, um, you know, it depends on how quickly you think history moves. 
And I tend to think history moves very slowly. And, you know, and why, and is that the optimum answer? I don't think that's, that's clear that Palestinians or Israelis think that's the optimum answer, even if you see greater discussion about a one state solution among Palestinians now. Do you see the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, as being a secularizing or religionizing force? in Israeli society. You talked a lot about Hadata, religious, religionization. What's the role of the, of the uh, IDF in that? Yeah, so I, I wrote a chapter on this in the, in the book, um, talking about these two competing, I think, uh, cultures within the IDF. Um, that really, this is a generationally significant matter because the two cultures take on greater um, parity at the time when this generation is serving um, their, their conscripted service and then um, also their, um, their reserve uh, duty. So you have this uh, kind of the, the secular, uh, which was um, overall, the, the the main culture in the army, even you know through the through the 2000s, and and people um, I think would still say that it's a largely secular culture that's trying to accommodate um, religious diversity, including uh, including the Orthodox. Um, what I I found, and I talk about competition in in Jewish consciousness education, that part of the IDF's activity is also um, what I say is a traditional, a Jewish traditional culture within the IDF. So this is not just um, officers um, who are religious Zionists, of course, with, there are growing numbers or indeed, um, you know, the largely um, religious uh, Zionist character of the, um, uh, the military rabbinate. Um, but, you know, an overall kind of shift within, um, within the culture from the top down, um, which is um, more, I suppose, inclined to and open to um, Jewish religious interpretations of, um, of the state of the land. Um, and what I think we see are two, uh, two competing cultures. I don't think the IDF is religionizing the state. I think the state is having an impact on the character of the IDF. And then I think there are um, uh, controversial instances where it appears that um, some officers may attempt to um, religionize the conflict with the Palestinians, but what I saw was um, resistance within um, that millennial um, class of, of commanders to largely to attempts to bring religion into the conflict. Okay, I think we have time for uh, one more question, maybe. Um, uh, of course, I can't find it now. Oh, yes. Uh, how and whereabouts in Israel were your interviews conducted? I guess inside Israel there's a huge difference among cities when it comes to religious inclinations. Presumably the, the, the difference between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, I guess. Yeah. No, absolutely. absolutely. Um, if the person who asked wanted, wants to know more detail about the method, um, drop me an email. I'm really happy to, to talk about that um, more. So the interviews are, are all uh, carried out with people who are within the green line. Um, Kaylee Madoff has written some, uh, a really wonderful PhD about um, Hiloni who live uh, across, across the green line in the settlements. Um, Mine were uh, conducted within within the Green Line, um, and I tried to get a, a balance of people who um, lived in Tel Aviv, uh, Haifa, Jerusalem, um, lived on Kibbutzim, Moshavim, um, people who lived who lived in the south, um, 
trying to get a balance of, you know, people who grew up in, in rural areas um, versus growing up within, um, within the city. Um, you know, and you just, in this kind of project, try to get, um, I suppose, some sort of balance. But, you know, in terms of the, you know, all of the assumptions that we have about things were there and they weren't there, you know. Um, secular Jews in Jerusalem were annoyed by how religious the city is becoming. Haifa, people had more contact um, with, with Arabs. Um, Tel Aviv was more, you know, sort of, uh, so I, I call it the, you know, the beating heart of the, of the Haloni culture. Um, but it, you know, the thing I want to say about the geography as well as, you know, any different subsectors within um, this population is the thing that, you know, there were very strong commonalities. There's, you know, there was nothing uh, that, that stood out especially you know, what I wanted to emphasize was the, um, the commonalities across um, geography, um, across gender, across group. Um, something Alma and Alma point out, and, and I found it as well, is there's a bit of a difference between the older part of this group who might have served in the second intifada at the very end and the, the very young members of this group, um, but very strong commonality. Okay, thank you very much. I've uh, managed to ask, answer quite a few of the uh, questions. So thank you very much, Stacey, and uh, good luck with the book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian, for joining me. It's been a really great privilege. Thank you, everybody who, who joined. Um, it was really wonderful to have you. Um, and hopefully in 2021, we can do more things in person. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, bye-bye now. Take care. Bye.